no one's effing coming to save you. No one's going to make you better at your business. No one is going to get you to be a better persuader of people or framer of people other than you. What would you say to someone who's still living in that delusion? Wake up. The thing is, is it doesn't actually matter if it is your fault, but it is your problem. You have to solve it because no one else will. That allows you to actually do something about it. If you make a hundred cold calls, whether you hate it or you love it or you're meant for it, you make the calls and you practice the script, you'll get business. You can also get business and make money even if you don't deserve it. But the idea that I could still have it anyways and not deserve it if I only did the things that got it was like, it was kind of like in the, in the weightlifting world that the iron is the iron. Whether you're black, you're white, you're a woman, 500 pounds is 500 pounds. Like the actions that create success are often, are kind of the same way. Anyone can do the thing and get the result no matter how they feel about themselves. And I think that's really freeing. The Rocky cutscene lasts two minutes in the movie, but it can last five years in real life. Mm -hmm. There is no background music. There's no audience waiting to cheer for you, and you don't know that you're gonna beat Apollo Creed. So you're in it for five years, and I think the hard part of entrepreneurship is the uncertainty that you don't know if it's gonna work out. But taking to the other natural extreme, if you did know and you were guaranteed that it was going to work, it wouldn't be worth it. We want a guarantee from a world that doesn't give any. And the fact that it doesn't give a guarantee is what makes it worth it. To the person who is still you know, plugged in and waiting for someone to save them, someone will save you, but it's you. Future you, the better you. The person that you've been waiting to become. It's not good, it's outstanding, it's truth. Hey, it's Ed My Lad. I just wanted to thank you for being here, and I would ask you to please subscribe to the show. If you just click the subscribe button here, I would really appreciate it. It helps the show grow so we can get even more successful guests on the program to help you. At the same time, if you're subscribed, you're going to get access to the programs before anybody else in the world gets access to them. So if you would, click subscribe right here. Thanks so much. Welcome back, everybody. This person sitting across from me, he's been on the show before. You guys all went nuts when he was on. But I got to tell you, he's probably the person whose content I share the most on the planet because I think it's that good. Um, I really, really like a lot of people uh, in the business space. I admire and listen to very few. And he has risen up the list for me of the people that I admire and I listen to the most because his content is so good. His message is so good because it's based in actual results and actual experience. My guest today is Alex Hermosi. Welcome back, brother. Thank you for having me. And, um, such a gracious introduction. I just to apologize ahead of time to the audience. There's no way I will live up to that, but I'll do my absolute hardest. I'll try my hardest. <laughs> he will. 15 minutes in, he will have exceeded it. <laughs> By the way, he's got a new book out called Hundred Million Dollar Leads: How to Get Strangers to Want to Buy Your Stuff. And uh, I think it's the book launch. I told you this off camera. I've heard the most about ever. He had a few people participate in it. How many did you have? Tell them. Yeah, we had 500,000 people who uh, signed up for the event. We had just under 200,000 who clicked to join live. Um, the moment we, we launched, it was uh, it was wild. It was a whole city. Um, and I said to him, I said, well, how'd you do it? He go, actually, I did the stuff in the book. Yeah. Give us a couple specifics of what yeah. that means. I'm going to give a little bit more context and I'll give the, the yeah. better answer. So yeah. $100 million offers, which is my first book, was an offer about making a proposition to somebody that they would say yes to. So how to make offers so good people feel stupid saying no. And the first question that you need to answer when you're an entrepreneur is, what do I sell? Right? And so mm -hmm. you make an offer. And that's why that was the first book. And so the offer book itself was what I would consider a meta book, as in it both the goal was that I demonstrate the concept while also with the book, while also teaching about it in the book. And so the book itself, I, I premiered it for $1.99 and it came with a course that most people charge $5,000 for. And I gave that away for free and did no paid advertising whatsoever. And it continues to sell 25,000, 30,000 copies a month. <laughs> this month, obviously way more than that because mm -hmm. of the launch and whatnot. But, uh, but it does more every month than it did the month before. And it's still top 100 two years later. Now, the next book answers the next question. So once you have something to sell, then you're like, well, who do I sell it to? Yeah. And so you need leads. And so that was why the second book is $100 million leads. And so leads mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But most people agree that they're the first thing that you need to have to get new customers. Hello. <laughs> right? right. And so 
the thing that creates a lead, and when I was trying to go through this book, I was like, what is a lead? And so I had a buddy of mine ask me that question, and I, I stumbled. For, I was like, you know, a lead. And he was mm-hmm. like, no, what's a lead? Mm-hmm. And so I was like, you know, it's a, it's someone that you, you know, uh, you get name, phone number, email address. And he's like, okay, um, if someone follows you on Instagram and you can message them, are they a lead? Mm-hmm. I was like, well, yeah, I guess they would be a lead. Mm-hmm. He's like, okay, well, if I subscribe to your YouTube, am I a lead then? I was like, no, I, I get, I guess not. It wouldn't be because I can't, I can't contact you in any way. Mm-hmm. And so we started going through all these things. If someone, if I knock on someone's door, are they a lead, right? And so we started yeah. going through it. And so we come up with a lead is a person you can contact. Okay. Now from there, you're like, well, there's a lot of people I can contact, which then gave me the conclusion that it, what people say they want is leads, but what they really want are engaged leads, which is a person you can contact, comma, who's shown interest in the stuff you sell. So would you call it a qualified lead? That the next level. Okay. So yeah, if you're looking on the lead continuum, you've got okay. unengaged lead, engaged lead, a qualified lead, okay. and then yeah, and then you go into customer and whatnot. And so, uh, so th- then the question is, how do you go from an unengaged lead to an engaged lead? And that one, that one flip, just from there to there, is the entire book. After that point, where someone raises their hand and says, "I'm interested in your stuff," that is where the book ends. Okay. And so I wanted to show people how to get strangers to want to buy their stuff, not mm-hmm. to buy it because that would be sales, mm-hmm. but how to want to buy their stuff. And so, in going through this. Um, we made two four boxes, and this took it's awesome a hundred iterations to get here. I was looking at it here. again last night. It's awesome. It was really hard, it, like yeah. as crazy as it sounds. I believe I, it. I came into it with a lot of the preconceived. I was like, what, what about earned media? What about owned media? Like I had all mm-hmm. these, and I had to deconstruct everything into simply, you can talk to people one on one, and you can talk to people one to many, and there are people who know who you are before you talk to them, and there are people who don't, mm-hmm. and those are the those are the four variables. So if you're one to one to friendlies, that's a warm reach out. If you're one to one to strangers, it's a cold reach out. Mm-hmm. If you're one to many to friends, it's when you post content. It's your audience who knows you. And if you're doing one to many to people who don't know you, it's paid ads. Gosh, that's good. Okay. And so those are the only four ways that a person can let other people know about stuff, mm-hmm. anything at all. Like if a girl's like, I just slept with six guys, she's advertising what she did. She let people know about it, mm-hmm. right? And so advertising is the process of making known. Mm-hmm. That's how we define it. And so then you're like, well, if those are the only four things that I can do to let other people know about stuff, are those the only four ways to advertise? And so the answer is kind of like yes and no, because the other four are what I call lead getters. And so lead getters are people who let other people know on your behalf. Yes. And so they are where you get the greatest amount of leverage in advertising. Because, mm-hmm. for example, if I were to say, okay, I'm going to hire uh, a, a recruiter who brings me affiliates every month. Mm-hmm. And so I hire one person, so I do whatever amount of work it takes me to hire one person. Mm-hmm. And then I go and I sip my ties on the beach, which we know that's not true, but just for yeah. the example. Now that person works every hour of every day, bringing affiliates in. And then those affiliates, then either they do one of the core four, they reach out to their friends, they reach out to strangers, they post content, or they make ads to their audience to tell them about my stuff. Okay. For money, free stuff, or both. That's okay. the incentive. And so that is an example of a lead getter and how one day's work might create zillions of dollars on the back end by just having leverage, getting more for what I put in. And so there are four. The first is customers. So you do the core right. four. I was going to ask you. Yeah. You yeah. do the core four to get a customer. Yeah. Now that customer can then do the core four again mm-hmm. to get you other customers. Do you feel that there is a uh, priority among others? In other words, when you were saying it, I'm yeah. like, customer might be the best oh, one. Oh yeah, for sure. The reason I would say customer is more important isn't as much about the customer, but about what would make a customer want to refer is typically an exceptional product. And so if you have a better product, like you can incentivize any affiliate if you better put product enough or money. better experience. Right, okay. exactly. Okay. So I'll, I'll quickly go through the four lead getters and then and then I'll, I'll explain the whole cycle in, in, in total. So you have customers, you have affiliates, which I talked about just a second ago, which looks like a customer referral, mm-hmm. but it's a little different because it's, a, it's another business who refers their customers to you. Mm-hmm. You've got... Um, Agencies who can do the core four on your behalf, they can run ads, they can post content, they can do outreach all for you because there are agencies who do all those things. And then you have employees. So like I didn't, I don't make my content. I have a team of people who make content for me. Mm -hmm. And so you can see how the first four things are the only things a human can do to let other people know about stuff, to advertise. Mm -hmm. The other four are the people you get from advertising who can then do the advertising on your behalf. Mm -hmm. And so the long-winded answer for like, how did I get 500,000 people there is that I purposefully took the 24 months leading up to that because once offers launched, everything was about leads. So I knew that, the audience didn't know that, but everything that I was doing was knowing that in 24 months I was gonna have my next book come out. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to use every tactic or method in the book to advertise mm-hmm. 
to advertise the book. Mm -hmm. So that's the whole meta concept. The first one was I had to make a meta offer. Like the book itself was an amazing offer. So good people feel stupid at saying no. And then $100 million leads, I wanted to get as many strangers to want to buy my stuff using warm outreach, cold outreach, uh, posting content, running paid ads, getting customer referrals, affiliates, agencies, and employees. So and the so I used launch itself is validation of the book itself. Yes. Keep going. And so the thing that always grinds my gears, and I think what I've, I've strived really hard to do uh, with the content that I make, et cetera, is that I always want the proof to be undeniable. Mm -hmm. And so like I... I started the presentation for the book launch with this little picture of a book that says how to market a book and it has 14 reviews on Amazon and whoever wrote this book, I hope I, I'm not just like just destroying you. That's not my goal. I blacked out the name. I don't know who it is. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't need to read the book because I already have evidence that the person doesn't know how to market a book because if they knew how to market a book, they wouldn't have 14 reviews. So like mm -hmm. I have real world evidence that the contents of the book are irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to do the exact opposite of that, yeah. which is if you're going to have a book about advertising, it should be advertised better than anything. <laughs> and so that was exactly what I wanted to do, was mm -hmm. just lean really hard on that and purposefully use only the things that I have in the book. Mm -hmm. And so, which was actually kind of fun for me. So like when, sure. we, when we scripted out the ads, I have an ad, ad creation framework that I just, I just used the framework that I introduced in the book only. Mm -hmm. And with the affiliates, I had the, the structure that I set up in the book, I used only. Mm -hmm. um, like I call it, talk about whis whisper tea shout, which is kind of like the method that you do to launch anything, or at least that I used to launch anything. Um, you know, like we used agencies when we didn't have to, because I wanted to have an agency run it so I could talk about that. Mm -hmm. And then obviously the team did all the content. And so we used all eight methods to promote the book. And then that is what resulted in. We had 137,000 people who came from paid ads. We had 104,000 people who came from affiliates. We had 27,000 affiliates sign up to promote the book launch. Mm -hmm. We had we had just under we had so, just sorry just over 200,000 people that came from content, um, and then we had what am I missing? And then referrals. The rest were referrals. Do you? By the way, everyone hearing this right now, it's amazing to me. Obviously, the detail of the book and all of that is one thing. The other thing is that how many people, all the concepts you just described to them, even if they were at the book launch, is still foreign of them, meaning they still look at business almost like a linear transaction. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're. this is a simple analogy. Look, here's how I got wealthy. I don't play checkers in business. I'm playing chess. I've got multiple moves that I'm already making in front of the other one that set up something else. Most people are like, I just got to get this client. And then once I get that, whew, I'll done. breathe out loud. And then I'm going to go through this arduous, grinding, debilitating, horrific, self-loathing process to get one more. Yeah. Right? The power of one more. That's yeah, right? what Ed Milet says. Yeah, yeah. And do you agree with that, though? Does it still blow your mind how many people still don't get progressive marketing that stacks on top of one another? Funnel's a terrible word, but yeah. there's multiple funnels happening here, meaning you've got the affiliate funnel. You've mm -hmm. got the paid ad funnel, if you choose to do it that yeah. way. You've got your content or client referral funnel. Yeah. But most people in their businesses, they're still, what you just did is so brilliant, it's like washing over them still, even of the half a million people that were there. You and I know this. It's they, they, they're picturing how business works fundamentally incorrectly. Would you agree with that? I think so. And I think part of it is, I would, so I would say it's more like a, like, at least from my perspective, like an incomplete picture. Um, mm -hmm. So they, they, see, they can usually, see, you can only see as far as like what's in front of you. And mm -hmm. so if you are barely making rent, you know what I mean? And you're barely making payroll, it's really difficult to think about brand. <laughs> you know what I, I mean? And so it doesn't make it less important though. Mm -hmm. But it's just really hard. And so, you know, for at least the, the prescription that I have in the book for advertising is pick one method. You can mm -hmm. pick warm reach outs, you can pick cold reach outs, you can pick, you can pick making content, you can pick uh, running paid ads. And those are all the things that you can do. And I start there because most people reading anything in business are usually the ones doing it for mm -hmm. the most part. And so we start with the core four that a person can do. But of course, all four work better together. Yes. Now you can just do cold calls and you can you can build a business. Mm -hmm. You can just run paid ads, you can you can build a business. But if you do cold calls, run ads and have content that people consume when they click your ad, they consume some content and then they complete the transaction mm -hmm. or they you do a cold call, they they take the set call and between the set and the close they go to your profile, they read some stuff, they watch a video or and they're like, "Oh, this guy's legit." Now, if you didn't have that, 
the likelihood that you close them would be way lower. But you would attribute the failed close to bad cold calling. Mm-hmm. But you could have given the assist with brand, with content. Let me ask you a hard question. I bet I bet yeah. no one's asked this. And if they have, cool. <laughs> but I was thinking at your work, and it, like yeah. I was going through all of it last night again. And I was thinking, okay, I want to ask them the tough stuff, like the stuff yeah. no one's going to ask them in an interview. I want two entrepreneurs pushing one another to figure this out even yeah. together, okay? So what if the sales cycle of your product is different? Does that dictate which way you should go? So let me give you an example. Mm-hmm. I'm marketing a book that's a tangible product sure. that can be acquired instantaneously. Yeah. Let's switch it. Let's make it a hard one. I'm a realtor. Yeah. I'm in the mortgage business. Yeah. I'm in the insurance business. This sales cycle is a mm-hmm. little bit different. It's not necessarily A to B, bam, we've got a client. Yeah. Does that change your methodology? And let's walk through a real world one. I'm a realtor. Yeah. Let's use the, what I think is maybe the hardest one to make the application fit on some cycles. Sure. Do you pick a lane, all of the lanes, and does that matter that the product isn't a consumable can of Coca-Cola or a bottle of water, but it's a transaction experience that you're going to have to go through in the mm-hmm. sales cycle? I don't think it would matter at all. Okay. So if we were to just let's fill in the fill in the boxes if we if we yep. will so like if you're a realtor warm outreach is going to be you, you reaching out to your friends and family saying do you know anybody who's interested in buying a house now mm-hmm. ideally you'd probably not start with that because that's what every realtor says mm-hmm. so it might be something like hey what's your dream home or something mm-hmm. like that and then you can start talking about something more interesting believe me I'm not in the real estate space so mm-hmm. hopefully there'd be a better hook but that would be the idea mm-hmm. cold reach outs is you're you're just dialing numbers that are close to you or cold emailing or you know. That is that is cold reach out. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're making content, you're talking about the houses that you're selling, and many realtors do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have paid ads, which also plenty of realtors either generate buyer or seller leads mm-hmm. that they call, and then they can help them sell their house. So either they list houses and they show these, you know, six or seven carousels of cool houses, mm-hmm. and they get buyers, mm-hmm. or uh, they talk about recent sales, and then and use them as case studies for like, here's the 17 mm-hmm. steps in the process we took this house from, the owner thought they could sell for 500, I sold it for 575, and this was the 60 day process we ran through. If that sounds interesting, I can walk you through what I would do for your house, whatever. Mm-hmm. So that would be the core four. But a good realtor should also have friends who are ancillary to the industry. So it might be uh, you know, lawn care people, it might be, uh, I know there's regulations around loans and kickbacks and things like that, mm-hmm. but like, still cleaners, mm-hmm. anybody who does home services, you can still get referrals from them, which would be an affiliate, yep. right? Now, customer referrals is you sell the house and you ask them for friends, or before mm-hmm. you sell the house, you ask them for friends. Yep. Or sometimes they just do it on their own because they actually like you and you did a good job. That's right. From an agency perspective, you could hire agencies to do any of those things. And then if, you have more, if, you're, if you're a bigger realtor and you have a team of people, then you can use your employees to do any of those things on your behalf. And so the core four and the four lead getters work independent of whatever business you have because they are simply the only ways that one human can tell other human about stuff. It's a fact. So let me give you an example. Yeah. I have several homes listed right now, just different things I'm doing. I'm just thinking through what you just said. One of the homes I have listed, they literally knocked on my door as a cold call. Yeah. And the fact that they did that, they make a lot of money too. I was like, this is my lady. Yeah. So that's one of them. The other one I have, an interior designer yeah. <laughs> referred me, the realtor that is now listing my house. <laughs> That, isn't that interesting? Yeah. And the third one just literally had a digital footprint mm-hmm. that I saw their digital footprint, yeah. went to their brand, was validated by other significant properties they had sold, yeah. and they're listing that property. So what he just said, I just gave you in my own life validation of all three of those methods right there off the top that I'm currently using, currently in the MLS with three people <laughs> in that industry, exactly the way that he just described. But I wanted to push you to describe it first. Because oh, yeah. I, that's the theory. Here's why. I think you're this way, too. There's validation, and then I want to push the theory to the extreme most difficult measure to see whether it passes the taken on water test. Yeah. And that's what it does for me. Number one thing I want to ask you someone's an entrepreneur, they're listening to this, and they are not getting enough leads yeah. in general. And they're they're literally thinking that what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to do just posting stuff on my Instagram over and over again, and people are going to magically appear. If right. there's one step now I should take to change my tactic, first thing I should do, aside from get the book, get the book, would be what? So if I needed to make money tomorrow, yes. and I was that guy, yes. it's the first of the core four in the book, which okay. is warm outreach. And so what that means is I go through my email and I look at every single contact that I already have already in my email list. I open up my iPhone or my Android and I go down my contact list and I download that and I export it. And then I look at every one of my social media profiles. I've got 700 followers on Instagram. I've got you know 400 friends on Facebook. And I list out all the people into one Mondo Excel sheet. That is my first leads list. Yep. And I reach out to them and I open with something that has nothing to do 
with my profession, <laughs> mm-hmm. which usually has something to do with their life. And so Got I take it. the 30 seconds before I message everyone because you only have a fixed amount of people. And I would say, what's new in Sarah's life? Sarah just had a kid. Sarah just moved. Sarah just had a baby. Sarah just competed in Tough Mudder, ter- whatever. Mm-hmm. And then that would be my opener. And then, mm-hmm. at, then it's house things, mm-hmm. right? And then once you have house things, then you transition, you can, you can move the conversation into whatever direction you want. If I'm selling fitness, I would say, oh, well, how do you have time to, you know, cook, cook food and, and get in shape? If, if it was, uh, you know, I was career coaching, I'd be like, how are you making time for work and your career goals? If I was talking about, if I was selling therapy, I would say like, how's your mental state with like crushing all these goals? But like, are you taking time for yourself? Like I could, you know what I mean? Like yes. I could sell anything from once I just know, once I have their attention and we use something that I call the ACA framework, which we learn from the gym world, but it works with anything. It's really just how to talk to a human being, but it's acknowledge whatever they said, compliment them on a legitimate compliment, and then ask the next question. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of people just don't know how to have a conversation. And so whenever someone says, you know, I, you know, I did the tough mutter, I would say, it's so cool that you did the tough mutter compliment, which would then say something like, that's <laughs> like, that's so tough of you. Um, I would say, <laughs> you know, um, it's so cool that you take that time to, to push yourself, yep. you must be that type of person. I would label them with something that I want to use later in the sale. And then, uh, so, and then the ask is, let me move the conversation forward, mm-hmm. right? And so that is, I then have my big list of every single contact that I have. Mm-hmm. And I start with the open hook that's personalized to them. And then I move them through ACA. Mm-hmm. And then I set them up for a 10 minute qualification call of some sort to just to make sure that they like whatever it is. And then I would set up for a real conversation. So, and if you're curious, what does that 10 minute call look like? Yes. It's, uh, so I use something called the closer framework. And it's not that this is the perfect way to sell. It's, it's just, it's ass. a, it's a simple, uh, acronym that I used to organize sales scripts. And so, C is clarify why they're there, right? Because they got on the phone for a reason or they decided to respond back to you for a reason. Mm -hmm. And so it's the first obstacle that comes up in any sale is someone says, I just wanted more information. Well, no, they didn't. They got there because they have a problem. Like you're not just hopping on phone calls for information all day. Of course you're not. Right. Like you can make that joke if you want to. (laughs) Really good. Right. And it's like, well, what, because then you just clarify, like, what problem do you want to solve? Like Mm -hmm. six months from now, what do you want to have happen? And then, then the person's like, well, I, you know, I can't fit in my jeans anymore. And you're like, right, boom, Mm -hmm. I've clarified where they're there. Then you restate it with L, label them with a problem. Mm -hmm. So to be clear, you're not the weight you want to be. You're currently how much? 200 pounds. What would you like to be? My high school weight. What's that? 130. Got it. Mm -hmm. Gap. Okay, cool. So then we go C, L. Now we go to O. So this is the closer framework. O is overview their past experiences. This is what I call the pain cycle. So you say, what have you tried so far? How did that work for you? What did you like? What did you not like? Whenever they say the things that they like, you mental note of that so that when you present your solution, you're going to talk about it and tie the things that they liked it's about part it. part of their buying map. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then the pain part is where they're like, oh, this was terrible. It's too hard to follow. Mm-hmm. They didn't pay attention to me. No one followed up, blah, blah, blah. And so then it's like, well, what else have you tried? And so we just keep doing until we've exhausted all the pain. And whenever you bring up past experiences, it always aggravates and increases in importance. So like in, in the political world, whatever the news cycle is on, people will say is the most important issue of the election. And it's really just whatever the media chooses to, Correct. whatever piano key they want to play on yep. everyone's emotions that month. But it works the same way on a micro level on a sale. So whatever you're talking about in the pain cycle is going to be the thing that they now think is more important. Maybe my health is more important. Maybe my the clean, cleanliness of my house is more Maybe I do need insurance, like whatever mm-hmm. it is, right? Um, and so in a set call, we stop there. So you basically go clarify, label, overview the past experiences. They're in the middle of pain. And you're like, I think I can totally help you. I don't have time right now. Let's put a much longer, because this is like a cold, like basically yep. it's a set call. Yep. Now, if someone has, if, if, you're, if you're selling a smaller ticket thing, then you can go cradle to grave, right? Mm-hmm. You can go to click to close if you want to. But if you're selling yep. an insurance product, you're yep. trying to buy, you know, get them to do a house or do mm-hmm. a, a longer sale, then cool. Then let me put some stuff together for yep. you so I can give you a much more informed answer. But I think we can really help you. Can I ask you a question before yeah. you do that? Do you get any commitment from them? Like if, there's, if I can end up helping you, are you open to me solving the solution for you? Or do you not get any hook close at that point? Yeah, we call it the integrity tie down. Yeah. So yeah, we... Yeah. Um, Yes, we okay. have uh, we have this big checklist that we call the, the lead nurture checklist, but it's like 17 things that mm-hmm. we that we do whatever like we take on a portfolio company. Um, we always look at their show rates on appointments, and mm-hmm. we can usually take all show rates, even in the coldest prospects, to 85. Yep. percent But it's it's li- like everyone's like, what's the one? there isn't one thing. Mm-hmm. You have to do like 17 things that each bump you by five to seven percent. But I like it. So you're gonna st- end the yeah. conversation there with some probably minor commitment totally. that if you can solve the problem, they're gonna move forward when you get back together. 100%. Okay. And so then <clears throat> when we go to the second call, we still go through CLO again. And you'd be yep. like, again? And you're yep. like, sure will. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> and you just dive a little bit deeper into all of them. And then you go SER. So S is sell the vacation. And I use this acronym, uh, this moniker, because 
I say, you want to sell the vacation, not the plane flight. And so a lot of people, when they, when they want to sell stuff, they talk about the widgets, right? They talk about TSA. They talk about checking their bag and taking their shoes off and who they're going to sit next to on the plane and the seat and how long the flight's going to be and the modules and the services and whatever. But people just want Maui. Yes. And so you should be describing the beach and the ocean and the, what they're going to experience the moment they get into the hotel room. Right. And they can open up the, the curtains and they look out the window like that's what we should be describing, not how they're going to get there. So you sell the vacation and then ER is explaining with their concerns. So once you sell the vacation, that's when you make the ask. Mm -hmm. And then ER is OK. If they don't say yes immediately, totally reasonable. Most people don't mm -hmm. uh, expect no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Train for no, because that's where you make the money. Um, and then we explain away their concerns. And so, you know, for, for us, I, I train on three major obstacles, which is they, they correspond to the distortions of reality um, from uh, Dr. Albert Ellis. Yeah. And so you've got people who are upset at the universe, so circumstances, you, that's on the outer, outermost mm -hmm. layer. And then the next level underneath, and this is like an onion. So if someone says no, and they say time, money, this isn't the perfect fit for me, all of those are circumstantial. Mm -hmm. And that's the easiest thing to say, and that's the first thing people say when they say no. The second level underneath of that is other people. So first people are, are upset and distorted about the universe. Everything's unfair, nothing goes my way. The next level is because of insert person, blame finger goes out, my kids, my husband, my coworkers, my mom, whatever it is, won't let me do this thing. And so they put all the power on the other person. And so we have to break that apart and get somebody who's in power who can actually make a decision. Mm -hmm. And usually I am a big believer in sales being an actual empowerment conversation. Because if you're talking to an empowered decision maker who's informed, that's the only person you want to talk to. Right. And I believe a well-structured sales conversation can increase the number of people who are that person. Agreed. And so uh, the final layer, the deepest one, um, is, is themselves. Right, and so they they have their own fears that they have to overcome, mm -hmm. um, and doubts about what's going to happen. And so we work through those those layers uh, until we eventually have a person who has now made a decision. And yeah. so when we can do that, I'm a big believer in like try and get yes and no. Not not to be not to be like hard closing, mm -hmm. but just so that if someone doesn't give a decision, then we want to walk them through how they make decisions, mm -hmm. so that they can make a decision about your product. Mm -hmm. And so. As we're going through, so that's that was basically just like the explain away concerns. And then finally, R is that the person says yes, mm -hmm. and you reinforce the decision. Okay. And so a certain percentage of sales, especially in high high volume transactional sales organizations, people back out. They get cold feet, yes. et cetera. And so what we try and do is the moment someone closes, we want the next 24 hours to be unbelievably choreographed. Yeah. And so like, and we're talking immediate. So mm -hmm. the moment they sign or the moment the credit card goes through, they get a text from the onboarding person or we do a warm handoff like, hey, this is Shirley. Shirley's going to be taken from here, like I said earlier. Mm -hmm. And so what we want to always do is set expectations, meet expectations, set expectations, meet expectations. And I have changed my tune about this. I used to always say over deliver, but I've, I've come to the point now where I, I genuinely believe that if you just keep your word, you nailed it, they will trust you more. And mm -hmm. ideally, and this is a little hack for everyone, if you're any any type of services business, let's say you're an agency that does mm -hmm. SEO, whatever, and it takes you 14 days to on-ramp somebody, mm -hmm. rather than saying we're going to touch in every week, mm -hmm. right, which would be fine, and that's what most people do. In that week, you probably do like 25 things, mm -hmm. right? But you're going to have one meeting. If you want to be really clever, every day, send an email that says, hey, no need for reply. Just want to let you know we did these three things. We'll recap at the end of the week, but I just want to let you know where we're at. If you send progress reports every day what happens is you create multiple reinforcement cycles and so you're setting and completing setting and completing and so at day seven when normally your competitor has only talked to them this is the first time they talked to them since the sale you had a warm handoff and they've received communication from you every single day so this is like the eighth touch point correct for them and now their trust in you is so much higher which then translates to way lower backouts, uh, way higher ascensions into whatever your next uh, revenue thing is or the next product or expansion revenue and more referrals and testimonials. Yeah. And so we try and choreograph that process and that's the R. And so close your framework, clarify whether they're there, label them with a problem that you can solve, overview their past experiences, the pain cycle, sell the vacation, not the plane flight, explaining where their concerns and then reinforce the decision. Okay, a lot to unpack there. Yes. Okay, so hang on. First <laughs> off, this is one of those notes, a segment on the show. Yeah. Re rewind it and go listen to it again. Okay. Go rewind seven minutes back or whatever that was and listen to it again because there's genius in there. I just wanna unpack a couple of the things. Most of you make the mistake in whatever it is that you're doing. You even do it with your kids. You're you are selling the plane flight. You're selling the process. You're selling the steps yeah. as opposed to the beach. That's a biggie. 
Number two, this this notion of the 24 hours post. I cannot get over how many people think the sale just got closed, I'm done. Yeah. I cannot get over it. Number one, you're probably going to lose the sale. Number two, you're definitely diminishing the amount of leads you're going to generate from it. I just did a very significant transaction with somebody. I had a very laid out process in my company. It's a very major exit type decision okay. for somebody. Okay. I told my team, the second we hang up this phone, he is going to begin to doubt this decision. Right. If he's an airplane, he's freaking losing altitude. We need to be doing X, Y, and Z. But it's already a predetermined process. I was yeah. just taking them back through reminding them yeah. why. Some of the businesses you have, it is just a 24-hour process. Some of you, to your other point, yeah. it's a week or eight or 10 days and whatever it might be. Sure enough, what was supposed to happen the next morning didn't. <laughs> right. By midday, we were behind. Then he messages us with a question, right. which we replied to. Then he messaged with another one. When the second question came in, I messaged the entire team. This deal's over. Yeah, We're losing this deal. No, 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 we can get it back. We've lost the deal. He has switched. He's got yeah. downward momentum, yeah. and it's our fault. Yeah. Sure enough, massive, like close to nine-figure mistake yeah. that was a process that was involved. Some of you are making a $800 mistake yeah. when this happens. Let me ask you a hard question because this is something I've done in my career. It's not process-driven, but it's important. You went through this process. Sometimes I think that somewhere in that flow, tell me if intuition works or you just stick yeah. to the process. Somewhere in that flow before you get to close, I've had the intuition, you know, this person's ready right now. Mm -hmm. I can go to this step. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily something that's able to teach on scale. Do you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I've also watched a lot of people go, you have them here, mm -hmm. and now you're beginning to layer objections in it, and it's taking longer than their tolerance right. level is. I see a lot of people, especially the longer they're in Unselling sales, them. they unsell them. They give yeah. them more. Let me tell you one more thing. One yeah. other thing you should know. One other thing. Yeah. By the way, my checklist says step four is I then yeah. do this. Do you? Because scaling this isn't as easy as... Yeah. But I also know the real world. Yeah. Should someone still have sensory acuity when they're in the process and go, we're ready now? So the way that we train sales um, is that, one, we start, you might love this. Okay. So we try and think back to front, which is if someone, a lot of people train rapport building first. They train the script top to bottom. Mm -hmm. But if someone knows how to do the first half of the script and they don't know the second half of the script, the likelihood that they can close is zero. Yes. If you train <laughs> people true. from the back of the script to the front of the script, if someone doesn't have rapport and they don't know the opening questions, but they know how to close, the likelihood they could close is greater than zero. 100%. And so, 100%. And so for us, my belief from a selling perspective is that if, if you follow the closer, right, clarify where they're there, all we're doing is asking questions. Mm -hmm. Labeling them is just asking for agreement on mm -hmm. one statement that mm -hmm. they have the problem. Overviewing past experience is just questions. Mm -hmm. We haven't said anything else. We're just asking questions. Mm -hmm. And then the only time you actually make a statement is when you sell the vacation. And then after that, you ask. And so for us, we the E only comes out after they've said no. And so we Got it. we explain it through uh, obstacles it. and objections. And so objections, as I see them, come up after the ask. Mm -hmm. Obstacles come up before the ask. Mm -hmm. And so if someone says, "I'm just here for more information," that's an obstacle. So we want to ha we handle that up front. Mm -hmm. If you know, like, and up front again, it's like, is there any other decision makers that need to be on the call? And we mm -hmm. ask that in the nurture process before we're on the call, and we'll reaffirm that at the beginning because if they say no mm -hmm. or yes, I do need someone, then like, cool, let's just reschedule. There's no point in going through this. Objections happen, which is universe like time, money, yeah. fit. Uh, I need the other decision maker, or I don't know how to make a decision, which is the personal thing, the doubt part. Mm -hmm. And so then we walk them through making the decision making process. Mm -hmm. But each one of those, we always loop back. So they give us the thing. We overcome it and we say, great, so now you're ready or mm -hmm. makes sense, fair mm -hmm. enough, let's ready to move forward, do you have your idea on you, whatever the closing question is. Right. And so that way, as soon as someone says yes, that is when we stop selling. Okay. So that's the big, to your point of, yeah, uh, of the stop. unselling is because people then get like really excited. It's like, dude, take the credit card. Exactly. Like, as soon as they say yes, great, what card do you want to use? Yeah, by the way, I know my audience is like, dude, this is hardcore today, which is oh, exactly, sorry. no, 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 this is exactly <laughs> what you bring to the table. And it's actually the stuff like, you know, look, it'd be great. We could do another episode today if you want. Like, hey guys, you know, be positive. Positive manifestation. Right? Like we could do yeah. that or we can actually give you teeth. Okay, here's something you do very well. This is where I think the offer and the lead thing sort of uh, marry one another. Totally. I'm watching you. I listen to you. And you either do this unconsciously, which I doubt. The <laughs> best people that I know that are entrepreneurs of any type, okay? You can even go to Jobs and I can argue he was great at it. You can go to Musk, I can argue he was great at it. You can go to a hardcore selling person like 
uh, Ellison or whatever. Okay. okay. They know how to frame. Mm-hmm. Okay, Alex, you're an incredible framer. Okay. <laughs> you know how to pre-frame something before you do it. You know how to create the frame when you're doing it. And then you know how to post frame. I'm amazed, blown away. Like a great speaker walks out on a stage. They pre-frame what's going to happen there today. Then they sit in the frame with you. Then they tell you what just happened. Yeah. Okay. This is just something most people are oblivious to. And if you're not good at it, you may get a close and not get leads. Right. If you're not good at this framing stuff, your ad's going to suck. Right. If you're not good at this framing stuff, your affiliates aren't going to offer it correctly. So all of this fits in there. I'm good at very few things. I'm a really good framer. No, no, I'm a really good framer of messaging. Of I framed you in the beginning of the message. I just yeah. framed the complicated thing you just called yeah. it. So I reframed what it means. Are you conscious of that? Do you teach it? Do you think it's something that most entrepreneurs and salespeople, entrepreneurs and or salespeople, are not aware of enough? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of teaching it, I don't. I think that good. Fr- I think framing, to your point, using a different word, just contextualizing. I think it's I think it's a teaching skill, mm-hmm. and so what we're what we're saying is like I said this this is what this means it's like I'm translating this because you might speak in techno jargon for mm-hmm. whatever the thing mm-hmm. that you're selling is mm-hmm. and they're like you just said a lot of words and you're like it means your house is going to be protected right that's what this means can I give you, you another sleep example? well at night can I give you another example of yeah. a frame y- your launch yeah you framed it as here's everything that's going to be here's everything that's going to be here's going to be and then and it's free yeah so you created a particular frame. Yeah. And then you stepped out of it and shocked them. Yeah. But what you did is, first off, you have a generous heart, and that's why yeah. you really did it. But let's also be honest. You created this massive value frame. Yeah. This would cost you this. Yeah. This is how I did it. This would do this. This would do this. And then emotionally at the end, because you were emotional about what you were giving them and believed in it so deeply. Yeah. But then you kind of stepped out of the frame and went, all that? Yeah. Bam. And now you're back in a new frame, which was a value, gift, generosity. Now everybody leaves the launch. It's a super important. I don't even know if you know you did this. I mean, I, I know you know what you were doing, but I don't know if you know what that led. You have built a reputation of being someone who brings tremendous value. Okay? That's one thing. Tremendous value. Well-prepared. Articulate. You know, cutting edge. Clearly does this. Isn't talking about theory. Yeah. That was the frame that was going on the entire launch. And then you stepped out of the frame and became a Jesus figure. <laughs> Literally, your frame changed. Kind generous giving philanthropic and so you get this great value frame and then you stepped in do you guys all know what i'm saying in other words he created great value then he stepped out of the frame and gave it to you and that that's that's it's an to your point an irresistible offer when you do it that way were you conscious of that and when i explain it back to you do you see what i'm describing yeah you use two frames there yeah 100 percent um punking the game (laughs) <laughs> is that what you call that? Well, I, I just a, 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 fr- a phrase I like for mm-hmm. it. Um, and it was so good, Alex. And I'm, 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 I, it was so good. It's going to make it really hard for anybody else to launch a book. Hopefully. No, it's going to make it really hard. <laughs> you changed what that frame looks like now. And honestly, I wanted to honor the book because of how much time I put into it. Mm-hmm. And so I put, I put probably 200 hours into the presentation. Um, but I put I put two thousand hours into the book, mm-hmm. and so it was only ten percent of my work from the book went into the presentation. Even though the presentation was a you know a big a big thing, mm-hmm. um, but to your point with the contextualizing, like if I said, "Here's this thing, enjoy it," people don't know how to process that. Yes, and so it's breaking it down so that they can understand how how this will actually benefit their lives. Mm-hmm. And if I can, my hope was that people would at 12,000, at 5,000, at $3,000 as I price dropped yeah. during the during the, the pseudo pitch, that people, and I got messages after being like, dude, I was there at five, yeah. I was I was in. And mm-hmm. so it's different than giving a free gift. I wanted to give a $12,000 gift to every person that was there, but I had to justify why it was a $12,000 gift and why everybody would have paid that, but then instead got it for free. Um, but Alex, what I'm saying is that it was brilliant, and by the way, very generous of you. But this is something in the sales process. I don't think most people they're, yeah. they're giving away their product. They've not created a frame of its value yeah. before it's reduced to the access point that you can get it at. And that's something all of you just the concept of what we're describing. You've all got to start to understand, or you're not going to be as great as you could be. You're not going to be the goat at what you do. I want to go to I want to go to some of the things you've. Yeah. Here's something a guy said recently. This dude said, there's a moment when every boy realizes no one's coming to save him. And that's when he becomes a man. 
and some boys never get there and stay children forever. That guy was you that said that. And it's important when we step out of this. Like, this stuff matters because no one's effing coming to save you. No one's going to make you better at your business. No one is going to get you to be a better persuader of people or framer of people other than you. And I just feel like that's one of the more profound philosophical comments. There's a lot of grown men and women that are still boys and girls because they think someone else is coming to change their life. You say otherwise. What would you say to someone who's still living in that delusion? Wake up. I mean, r- reality probably stares at them in stark contrast to what they want. So they're like, it's, I use the blame finger a lot, which is that power, fo- power follows blame. Mm. And so if you blame the government who you think is supposed to save you, or you blame politicians who you think is supposed to save you, or blame your company that you work for who you think is supposed to save you, or you blame the market, it doesn't really matter, mm. or your parents the whoever you blame is the person you ultimately give power to and i find that really interesting because when i was that my moment of figuring this out was when i was 19 and i was really resentful of my parents specifically this instance was my mother and i blamed her for the way i was acting i was like well if she parented me differently i wouldn't be this egotistical and arrogant and blah, blah, whatever mm-hmm. and i realized that i actually was giving the person that at the time i disliked the most in the world hmm all the power over my behavior. Mm. And so I was like, so that idea sickened me that Mm. the person I disliked the most, again, at the time, Mm. was the one that I was actually giving my leash to. Wow. And so I was only acting in response to this leash and then, and and willingly, voluntarily giving her all the power over my life and all I was doing was reacting to what this person did or what the government does or the politicians do. And so the first... I mean, I've said this before, but the, the, the first two words of getting out of poverty are my fault. And the thing is, is it doesn't actually matter if it is your fault, but it is your problem. And so you have to solve it because no one else will. And so that, that, that allows you to actually do something about it. Mm. And so that, that's been, I'm a big believer in operationalizing and only thinking about things through actions rather than feelings because the feelings come and go. And also they are justified or unjustified. It also is irrelevant because like if you make a hundred cold calls, whether you hate it or you love it or you're meant for it or you, you'll, you'll, you never want to do it for the rest of your life, you make the calls and you practice the script, you'll get business. Mm-hmm. And you can also get business and make money even if you don't deserve it, which for me was actually a really comforting point because there was definitely moments in my life where I had tons of self-loathing, didn't think I deserved anything, blah, blah, blah. But the idea that I could still have it anyways and not to serve it if I only did the things that got it was like, it was kind of like in the, in the weightlifting world that the iron is the iron. Whether you're black, you're white, you're a woman, 500 pounds is 500 pounds. And so like the actions that create success are often, are kind of the same way, which is like the hundred phone calls or the hundred pounds on the bar, the work just needs doing. And it doesn't, and I think it's, it's incredible. For me, it's really inspiring that anyone can do the thing and get the result no matter how they feel about themselves. Mm. And I think that's really freeing. Mm. And so to the person who is still, you know, plugged in and waiting for someone to save them, someone will save you, but it's you, future you, the better you, the person that you've been waiting to become. Bro, you almost look like a somber look on your face when you say it. Do you say <laughs> that because like you think so many people just aren't going to get that? Or do you say it because it's just so obvious to you at this point? I think it's because I've been there, mm-hmm. you know? And so that's... I think that's that's why you know my tone probably changes when I talk about that stuff. But it, like, I mean, the reason I make this the, all the content that I do is because like, I get it. Like, it was, I mean, it's tough. Mm-hmm. Like, it, I mean, it, the thing, uh, the Rocky cutscene lasts two minutes in the movie, but it can last five years in real life. Mm-hmm. And it's not, and there is no background music. You know what I mean? And there's no audience waiting to cheer for you, and you don't know that you're going to beat Apollo Creed. So you're in it for five years. And I think the hard part of entrepreneurship is the uncertainty that you don't know if it's going to work out. Mm -hmm. But taking to the other natural extreme, if you did know and you were guaranteed that it was going to work, it wouldn't be worth it. (laughs) So we want something from a world, we want a guarantee from a world that doesn't give any. And the fact that it doesn't give a guarantee is what makes it worth it. Bro. Bro. (laughs) My nephew's got an auto detailing business. He just started. And uh, he calls me, he goes, Uncle Eddie, I just don't know whether or not uh, my business is going to work and happen. And uh, 
I said, well, I don't know whether it's going to work or happen as well, but I know that if you did the work, it's likely to happen. Yeah. And I go, but are you willing to do the ugly? Yeah. He said, what do you mean? I said, the ugly, ugly. He goes, well, you know, I said, so your existing clients, do you have an affiliate program where they can refer you people? He goes, actually, I do. For every one of these, they get $25 or whatever it yeah. was. I go, that's really good. I said, how many are you getting from that? Right. And he goes, well, I only have like, you know, 18 clients. So like three of them have sent me somebody. I go, well, if that's all you continue to do, you're probably going to have a difficult time to your point of the paths. And he goes, well, what would you do? I said, I can tell you exactly what I would do. It would be inevitable. Um, what are you doing Saturdays and Sundays? You doing cars? He goes, no, I don't have any cars to do. I said, well, I'd go print out a whole bunch of flyers and I go knock on doors where people have cars. Yeah. And he goes, oh, really? I go, yeah, I'd knock on a hundred doors a Saturday. I'd give him my flyer, let him know about my business, get him exposure, let him know what a great job we do. Give him a list of my Instagram and they can see the other cars we've cleaned and the other things that we've yeah. done. And, and in any way, what happens is the more you have a specific plan like this where you're willing to do the ugly and run the numbers, your fear level diminishes to an extent. The notion that it's going to go away completely isn't true. Yeah. But there's something about doing the ugly thing that reduces fear. It not only increases your chance of winning, but you're like, the possibility mathematically of me losing now is rather small. Yeah. But when you're not doing these things, the reason you're living with so much fear is you know the possibility of you not winning is rather great. Yeah. And so you're living with a fear that's self-imposed, self-induced, and your fault because you're not willing to do the ugly. And I think that's why sometimes when I look back at those days, I have that same look you have. There's also an internal part of me that goes, man, I actually did those ugly things yeah. when I didn't want to, when I didn't have any desire to, and I wasn't sure it was going to work, but I was actually almost ensuring it was going to work based on the math part of it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? A hundred percent. One of my favorite like math equations to figure out is the input output equation to what I want. And so like, as soon as you can boil down whatever goal you have into like the most simple version of the action, which is like, I need to dial this many things, or I need to send this many emails, or I need to send this many direct messages, or I need to post this many posts of content, mm -hmm. or I need to run this much per day in advertising or PPC or SEO or whatever mm -hmm. it is. As soon as it boils down to that, then it's, then, then it's plug and chug. Then it's yes. just, then it, and then what happens is action alleviates anxiety. And so, so I'm, I'm going to give two polar extremes here. So, this is something I'm, I'm working on. But mm -hmm. so I told, I was saying earlier that I like operationalizing words and like what they mean, mm -hmm. right? And so sadness comes from the perceived lack of options. That's why it feels like hopelessness. You don't know what to do. That's why you feel sad. And you can solve that with knowledge, right? Because it's, sadness is actually an ignorance issue. You just, you just don't know. So if you did know what to do, then you wouldn't be sad anymore because you'd know what action to take. Anxiety is the opposite of that, which is you have many options in front of you, but you don't know which to take, which is a lack of priorities. And you solve that with a decision. Mm -hmm. And so usually you have lots of decisions that you haven't made, and then that's why you have anxiety. And so you need to confront decisions you need to make. And so there was a, a point that I was getting to, and I totally forgot because I got really excited about this stuff. But <laughs> No, it was the fact about, about um, action and reducing fear when you don't know you, have, yes. you lose hope. Yes, and so... And so once you have the clear path of mm -hmm. like you, you, you solved it, which is why you're listening to this podcast, or you mm -hmm. read the books, that, so you can go from ignorance, mm -hmm. not knowing, to knowing what you need to do, mm -hmm. then it's literally just saying the first six hours of my day, every day, and I still do this, just so you get like this habit, like I, I was asked once, what was, what's the biggest ROI habit? Now everyone mm -hmm. has different things, but for me, it's that the first six hours of my day, every day, is dedicated to the activities that I need to do to move the business forward. Mm. I don't take meetings. I don't take calls. It's just me. Mm. After the, that six hours is when my day starts. So that's when I do, I take my meetings, I take my calls, mm -hmm. and whatever. And so in the early days, when I had customers, mm -hmm. <laughs> then that meant that I would work from four to ten, mm -hmm. and then I would do all my customer stuff after that. Now, where I'm at now, I don't have customers per se, and mm -hmm. so I wake up a little bit later, yeah. and I work and I work from six until, and the way that they, my my team schedules my calendars, they actually work from the back of the day forward, mm -hmm. and so if I have like three meetings, they're going to start them at the, you know the last one will be at four thirty, four, and then three thirty, and so I have from the moment I wake up until three thirty in the afternoon to move my stuff forward. That's how I work, but I'm not an operator. Layla, my wife, is stacked meetings all day long because she's running the teams and she's keeping cadence on stuff, and I say that because if you were the entrepreneur then in the beginning, your responsibility is to let other people know about your stuff. If more people know about your stuff, more people will buy it. 
That is a promise. You can take that to the bank. Mm -hmm. And so, like, if you think about it, the absolute natural extreme, if every person on planet Earth knew about your business, you would make more money. Mm -hmm. And so the question then just becomes, how do I let more people know about my stuff? And that's why I wrote the book. But it's like, and I, I wanted to make it action oriented because either you did the reach outs or you didn't. Either you posted the content or you didn't. Either you ran the ads or you didn't. And you switch who you're advertising to. So we're talking about affiliates. You can post content to get affiliates. You can do warm reach outs to get affiliates. You can run paid ads to get affiliates. Mm -hmm. You can also do all those things to get customers. And what do you think recruiting is? You do cold reach outs to get employees. You run ads to get employees. You like the, the process of making something known is the same, whether you're recruiting employees, recruiting customers, recruiting affiliates, recruiting an agency. How do you find out about agency? It's the same process of making known. And so right now, if you're not getting the amount of leads that you want, you're not advertising enough, period. Mm -hmm. And so, and again, with the leverage thing is that you don't need to be like, we got 500,000 leads you know, to, to come to, for the event, for, register for the book launch. I didn't get 500,000. Right. I I did. I'll tell you what I did. I hired someone who is a director of people who then hired a director of brand who organized my media team. If we're really talking about this, right? Mm -hmm. Who organized my media team who posted 300 pieces of content a week leading up to the launch of the book. My director of people hired my internal director of marketing who reached out to six agencies and picked the one that he thought was best suited to run our ads, mm -hmm. and they ran our ads for us. Mm -hmm. My And mind you, all of this came off of one thing for me, which was just we hired a director of people who then hired people who then got the thing. And so 500,000, mine was more or less like, we're going to follow this playbook. Yes. And then down it went. But if you're like, well, must be easy for you to say, yes. Mm -hmm. But it still starts with the first action. Which is if like I hadn't hired that person, I would have had to move one level down on that level of leverage. Yeah. And so if you're that solopreneur or you're a salesperson who works in an organization and you need to get your own leads, whatever it is, there are only four things that you can do to get leads that you yourself, you reach out to people you know, you reach out to people you don't know, you post content and you run ads. That's it. That's, it. That's so all there is. And if you're not doing those four things, whether it's to get affiliates, to get customers, to get employees, to get, get agencies it doesn't matter because those are the only four things that one person can do to let other people know about their stuff. So if you're not getting enough leads, you're not doing enough of that, period. It's not good. It's outstanding. It's truth. By the way, Sasha, have we really been going 45 or 50 minutes? 50 minutes? I literally think we've been doing this for 15 minutes. <laughs> I have never. I mean, dude, I've done 500 podcasts. I have never looked up at the clock and gone, it was 50 minutes. I thought it was like 15. I'm not exaggerating, and I'm not letting your ass go just yet. Yeah. Bro, I'm not exaggerating. That is the fastest freaking 50 minutes in the history of my life. I can't even get over that. That's nuts to me. That's how you know something is good. You mentioned Layla. I'm yeah. not going to let you out of here this time without talking about her. First off, one cool thing people don't know is like almost every single time you've reached out to me, which I love. And by the way, I totally want to do. <laughs> I've had to say no like three times to him. It's like this dude whose brain I love picking and I think he likes picking mine too. He just always asks me when I can't do something, right? And it's all sometimes like, what are you doing tonight? Yeah, that's Once in a while, there's a little of those, right? But um, you, it always includes her. Yeah. And I mean, look, you're brilliant, okay? Let's just be honest, okay? You are. Thanks. And then I watch her stuff and I'm like, dude. Yeah. She's freaking unbelievable. And I know you play different roles, but I actually posted something about today, and I just want your take on it. By the way, one of those other pointing at the other person as their objection for their life, some people point at their significant other totally. as their reason, right? You're giving somebody advice about that. Like, hey, you're going to have a running mate necessarily or not yeah. a running mate. What are some of the things you would recommend from your own experience with her that are most important or, or something that's even happened with you and her? So I will give my first frame, which is uh, we've only been together seven years, you know, married mm -hmm. six. And so I realize that I'm young in this game. So take this for what it is. Um, I think Layla and I practice acceptance very well, which is that the reason that I married Layla was that she never wanted to change anything about me. And that was, that was what I wanted. I just wanted to be me. And I felt like a lot of times I had to compromise or, you know, I felt like I needed to compromise who I was or what I wanted to do mm. for a middle ground. And I think there, there are plenty of marriages, to be fair, that, that do that and they do it exceptionally well. And this isn't me saying that that's good or bad or whatever. I'm only sharing what has worked for us is that Layla is Layla. And if she wants to wear 
the nicest clothes and drive the nicest cars and be in the nicest penthouses and stuff, then if it doesn't bother me, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, if I want to wear, I look like an electrician, you know, like, <laughs> you <laughs> a know? lumberjack electrician. Right? <laughs> um, then she doesn't try and dress me a certain way or make mm -hmm. me, you know, like, hey, it'd be really cool if you were just scruffy, you know, mm -hmm. or I wish you cut your hair like this. Like she, she just doesn't, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think the big thing for us is that we are absolutely aligned on the big mission and we're absolutely aligned on the values, which is so where we want to go and how we want to get there. And I think the third, the third piece that we look at is lifestyle. It's like, what do you like to do in the day to day or interests? I remember when I was debating whether I wanted to be with her or not, I had a coach at the time and he said, well, tell me about your stats. And I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, your stats. He's like, since you came in your life, are you making more money? Are you in better shape? Like, how do you, like, how do you feel? Like, do you have more energy? Like, are you doing more stuff? Are you getting close to your goals? And I thought about it. I was like, well, yeah, I am making way more money. And I mean, shoot, she makes me money because she was working for me. I was like, she literally, she's not, she's not a liability. She's a, she's an asset. You know, <laughs> she's like, she's making me money. Um, and so I, t you know, and it's like, and she's really fit. And so she like cooks healthy and she's getting me to eat a little healthier than I, you know, cause she's mm -hmm. cooking and, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm there. <laughs> right. 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 Um, and she goes to the gym more than I do. So I was like, you know, if I see her go, I'm like, oh, I should go, you know? And so every, when I thought about every one of the stats in my life, they all went up. And so I think that, and I've said this before, but like Layla and I didn't have a romantic chemistry fireworks beginning. Mm -hmm. um, my first date, I asked her to work for me and I said, this might not work out, but like you should totally work for me because you have a skill set that would make a lot of sense. And uh, that was my proposition. Right? <laughs> and uh, she said, no, I just met you from the internet. Uh, but, you know, three weeks later, she quit her job and she joined me at Gym Launch. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's just been absolute alignment of where we're trying to go, how we want to get there and the interests we have an absolute acceptance of not trying to change the other person or their goals. Now, if there was ever a time in the future where she said like, my goal differs from yours, mm -hmm. then it might not make sense anymore. Mm -hmm. But I think our goal is big enough and wide enough and it has, and because we are exposed to the same stimuli, and I think I have a tremendous amount of respect for people who don't work with their spouse because that's what I do and mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine it another way. Now I'm sure people in reverse mm -hmm. say the same thing, mm -hmm. but we get exposed to the same hardships. And so in a lot of ways, I feel like we continue to grow together or at least in parallel on the same path. Mm -hmm. If you're exposed to a lot of different stimuli and stressor than your spouse is, they're going to respond to those stressors and adapt just like any other organism would. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means you grow apart. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very grateful that we can work together and transparently that my wife has a skill set that is consistently incredibly valuable. Um, you know, because real talk, if, if Layla wasn't an exceptional CEO, then we wouldn't like Layla wouldn't be the CEO. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but she just is. People don't know this from the content, but I would argue that Layla is a better CEO than I am quote visionary. Mm -hmm. I think the ideas are easy. Mm -hmm. Doing it is hard. Mm -hmm. And she has made me look exceptional by making crazy ideas like a 500,000 person launch actually happen. Yeah. Like anyone can say, sure, let's let's do an affiliate program, let's do a referral program, let's do this, let's do let's get some agency. Like I, I say all that stuff, and then she's like, got a hundred and sixty eight item asana you know list, yeah. and then she starts dealing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Dealing and shelling these things out, and then all of a sudden, I get all the credit, which is you know a burden I have to bear. No. <laughs> Are you happy right now? Me? Yeah, I'm loving it. I'm in the game. Yeah, in like, the is oh no pun intended, but yeah. So you you are happy right now? This is the best this is the best version of me i've had so far mm -hmm. um but i i realized for me that my when i look back on the my short life mm -hmm. um the times that i have that i look as the good old times were always the times where i was in pursuit not when i was in achievement and i absolutely now have a massive bone that i'm chewing on and i there's nothing like if I have three days in a row on a long weekend and I have nothing planned and a big cup of coffee and a big ass goal I'm working on, like there is nothing in this world that makes me happier mm. than just being able to just pull a thread and just keep pulling it on my own uh, and working through something complex like writing the book, like the, like or organizing the launch or write, you know scripting the ads or you know coming up with the affiliate program that aligns every party associated with it. Mm. That's that's there's nothing I'd rather do. Like I don't have hobbies. Like that's, I get, I get, I get flack for this all the time. They're like, don't you think you're unbalanced? I'm like, why? 
Like, I like this. I like what I do every day. It's interesting what we share. By the way, I just did content that I released today that said if you're trying to change the person you're with, you're wasting your time, <laughs> right? I just did that. The other thing is that I have tried golf and I play a little bit, but the yeah. truth is business is my sport. Yeah. Business is my hobby. Changing people's lives is my passion. Yeah. And, like, of course I'm happy doing it. It would be like if you love golf and you played golf all the time, wouldn't you be happy? Like, I yeah. love doing this all the time. It makes me happy. I – um. I cannot get over how quickly this went. I almost feel like I would like to spend the night with you. <laughs> <laughs> can, can, can I add one caveat to the question that you asked about the happiness thing? Yeah. So happiness is a really tricky question. And I, I think t- I'll give a reframe for the audience that might be helpful, which is um, like wanting to be happy from a some, like a word perspective is in some way saying like, I want to eat a meal so big I'm never hungry again. It's, it's, a, it's a misnomer, and I, I prefer to use the word joy, that I experience joy or that I experience meaning in the work that I do because like you can mourn and be joyful, at least in my, yes. my two cents. And so I think that the idea that I think inhibits or prevents a lot of entrepreneurs from continuing down the path is that they are like, I'm not happy. But like happiness a lot of times is just a circumstantial, circumstantial response to whatever external thing. But I feel like joy is a lot more internal and you can be in the thick of it and working on your auto detailing business on the 37th door of that day and you have a little tick mark and you know you got to get to 100 and you had the last 36 slammed in your face. But like you can be joyful if you reframe the joy around the person you are becoming by doing the hard work. And the thing that has, I think right now, been my biggest area of interest in terms of my own performance has been truly divorcing outcome from winning. And like, it's re- it's really easy to say and really hard to do. But I want to be the father that when Timmy wins 10-0, I can look at him and be like, I'm disappointed in you, not because of the outcome, because I know you could have tried harder. And on the flip side, if he loses 10-0, I'm going to be like, Timmy, you worked your ass off. You left it all on the field. I'm proud of you. And I want to be Timmy to me <laughs> yeah. and, and, and judge myself by that. And I get in the most flow in the work when the, my metric for success is how hard I worked for it. And that has made joy feel like it's under my control more than anything else. And so that is what... I've been practicing on a daily basis and I think has for me unlocked a level of productivity and work that when I was more external and outcome focused was more ephemeral because like, you know what, I could have had the book launch and the internet could have gone down for the whole city of Vegas. Mm -hmm. But if I know that I had done everything in my absolute power to prepare, then I could still be proud of me and I would have earned my approval. And so it's more like that has been my consistent process of like, if I can just respect me for the work I did, then that is enough. That's another level right there. You just described me to me better than I've ever described to me. Bro, okay. Uh, by the way, everyone on my team, just so you know, that's a social media clip right there, the last minute and a half. That's uh, the best description I've ever heard of how I've lived my crazy life, and it explains me to me. Let me tell you what you just did in the last minute there, two minutes. You help. I'm, I'm being honest. I'm older than you, and I'm still richer what? than you, barely. But I mean, um, <laughs> Um, I say that, you know what I mean? You're definitely. I, uh, no, I don't know that anymore. But um, <laughs> you just described me to me. You just helped me understand myself very well. There's a depth to you, bro, and a dimension. The, my favorite people are really multidimensional people. And you online sometimes make yourself seem like you're just entrepreneurial dimensional. But what makes you such a creative, skilled, visionary entrepreneur is the dimension that you have, is, is your depth, is your depth. And you just exemplified it right there. I've just had somebody a lot younger than me just explain me to me better than I've ever understood myself, what you just said right there. And that's why I kind of look at you like a young son or a brother, <laughs> because that's exactly how I am. It's exactly, Alex, how I am. And it's made me understand why I I, uh, I actually live pretty joyfully most of the time, yet it's not something I'm going to go get and I'm going to slow down and cool down and then it's all going to rain down on me yeah. in those times. It's been the pursuit. Yeah. It's been the growth. Bro, such a great conversation. It is the fastest one. <laughs> 
in an in I guess now like an hour and ten minutes or whatever it's been that I've ever had, and I just feel I I feel this sense of like real accomplishment, yet I'm empty because I know we like barely scratched the surface. What we should just do is like let's just have you back every six months when you're in town, and we'll just <laughs> dig deeper into your brain. Thank thank you for today. Thank um, you, you guys. He's awesome. I don't need to sell this one to you. Like you just shared this with anybody who's ever got a business in your entire life. He's Alex Hermosi. You should be following him on social media. I fully endorse him, by the way. And you should go get $100 million leads. $100 million leads, how to get strangers to want to buy your stuff. Go check out acquisition.com. If you need help growing your business, Alex might be a dude you want to see as well. Can I add one thing? So just as a gift for you guys, um, if you like podcast stuff, I put both of my books on my podcast for free. Mm -hmm. So if you're like struggling right now, you don't have money, you're like, you know, $20 is going to kill me. Mm -hmm. Um, The game is called The Podcast and it's, um, shoot, it's it's high 500s. I can't remember the actual episode, but $100 million offers and $100 million leads, the audiobooks, I put them all in my podcast so you can just listen to them. Yeah, it went to the number one podcast on the planet when he did it. (laughs) So you guys go get it. He's not doing it because he wants another download. He's doing it. (laughs) I can promise you that. All right, guys. Alex, thank you. Thank you. God bless you, everybody. Max out. (laughs) 